Good evening, everyone. Thanks for thanks everyone for joining today's virtual public meeting of the upcoming spring 2021 MBTA service changes. My name is Angel Donahue Rodriguez, and I am the director of special projects at the MBTA, and I'll be moderating tonight's meeting. First, the MBTA had the MBTA team has a presentation, and we ask you to please hold all comments until the end of our presentation. Second, we'd like to remind everyone that this meeting is being audio and visually recorded and will be made publicly available. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few meeting controls for folks who are not familiar with Zoom. Next slide, please. We'll, we'll, we will have live language interpretation at tonight's meeting. I will explain how to select your preferred language now in English. Written instructions are, are provided on your screen now in Spanish, Chinese, uh, Creole, and Portuguese. In your meeting webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, please click interpretation. Then click the language that you would like to hear. Even participants, even participants listening in English should select English so that you can hear any comments being spoken in other languages. Next slide, please. This meeting will also include ASL interpreters. The meeting host will highlight the interpreters to ensure that they can be seen at all times. The ASL interpreters expect to switch approximately every 20 minutes. If at any point you cannot see the interpreter, please let the tech support know using the chat. Next slide. We also have closed captions for this meeting. If you do not see the captions, please press the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen to get them started. Next slide, please. If at any point during the meeting, you have any technical questions about Zoom or the accessibility features of today's meeting, please chat tech support. Next slide, please. On today's call, we are joined by Kat Benish, MBTA Chief of Operations and Strategy, Policy and Oversight, as well as Melissa DeLay, Senior Director of Service Planning, and Mr. Rob Diadamo, uh, Executive Director of the Commuter Rail, and several other members of our staff. We would also like to acknowledge all the elected officials and their staff that have joined us here today. I'd now like to turn things over to Kat to get us started. Kat? Great. Thanks, Angel. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy days to be here and be um, be a part of this. Uh, I will give a short presentation, hopefully no more than 20, 25 minutes along with Rob, uh, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, first and foremost, as Rob said, this process, um, excuse me, as Angel said, is this presentation is going to largely cover the changes that are coming up ahead in March and April. Um, the overall forging ahead process had some changes that went into effect in January uh, for the commuter rail and ferry, um, but largely want to use this opportunity to help explain the changes that are going to effect on March 14th for bus and rapid transit and April 5th for commuter rail, uh, which also has some impacts on the ride. So we'll go through some general context of forging ahead, and then we'll go mode by mode for the specific changes effective those dates. Now, uh, I also want to point out that for those who have been following the forging ahead process closely since November and December, um, we have received some additional federal funding, which means that we will be offsetting, rather not implementing, some of the changes that were approved in December 2020, and I will call those out as we go through. Uh, and just a reminder that this is a largely iterative process, that as we implement these changes, we will continue continuously review the impact of these changes and plan to adjust service uh, as possible based on crowding and demand. Um, and the MBTA does ch change our service levels or rather our schedules on a regular basis um, every quarterly for bus and rapid transit and every six months for commuter rail and ferry. Uh, and then as we think about when and how we rebuild and restore service, knowing that when we rebuild the system will we'll likely look different than what we were operating pre-COVID because we know travel patterns and mobility have fundamentally changed because of COVID. Uh, and because of that, when we rebuild, we will be using and leveraging our transformation plans as part of Rail Vision for commuter rail and the bus network redesign program for bus um, so that when we restore service, trying to do in line uh, with those redesign plans as they're built uh, and rolled out over the next year and beyond. Great. Um, so again, as a summary, um, 
the changes that we're putting into effect this spring are trying to ref better reflect ridership levels and making sure that first and foremost, that we are trying to preserve access and quality service for transit critical communities um, and our central riders. And the intent here is that, and we said this, I think repeatedly through the forging head process, that the MBTA never wants to cut service. Reducing service is always the option of the last resort. And building on the fact that we have seen different travel patterns because of COVID-19, when we think about reducing service to make sure it is not a one size fits all, but a very targeted nuanced and thoughtful approach that's taking into account who's riding, when they're riding and how do we best serve them. So the changes that we're putting into effect um, that were modified based on public feedback in the fall winter, the intent is to make sure that we can accelerate some service adjustments now, which is why some of these are being implemented in March rather than the summer so that we can increase service later when ridership increases where it's increasing. Two, that we can optimize our service with the limited resources that we have. And that three, trying to retain some flexibility so we can make changes based on what we observed this spring and summer. This is, uh, throughout this process, I think this is a very helpful chart. And this shows the MBTA ridership by mode index back to the last month of February. And what this shows is that ridership dropped precipitously in the first few weeks of the pandemic and the ban on essential services. Um, and that it has slowly been recovering since March and that we essentially hit our high watermark of ridership during the pandemic in September and October before dropping off in the winter. And that is quite co common um, and seen seasonally even pre-pandemic. And that furthermore, that throughout the pandemic, our paratransit blue line and the bus, which is the yellow line, have been the most durable. That is, they have retained the highest percentage of their ridership, though there is variation by time of day across bus route, et cetera, um, versus uh, the commuter rail and ferry, which have been the least durable throughout the pandemic. And just to, to go a little further in that um, is that we've have seen some really different travel patterns throughout. And I think what we have found throughout the pandemic that we've seen highest ridership on routes and modes that are serving essential trips. And I'll define that again in upcoming um, minority and low-income communities, areas with geographic barriers like the Boston Harbor that make switching to other modes uh, more difficult and communities with fewer residents who can work from home. And on the flip side, we've seen ridership lowest on routes and modes that are prim primarily serving uh, the more classic nine to five work commuters, communities with more residents who can work from home, uh, and then communities with more access to vehicles and other modes of transportation. I think this is us all having been through the pandemic together. I think a lot of this is now um, self-evident, but I think it's important to state because it's been a key element of how we thought about implementing forging ahead. And with that, I just wanted to recap what is the forging ahead framework. And the idea is that rather than reducing service everywhere at the same amount, is the idea that no matter what, we wanna make sure that we are providing a minimum acceptable service level for what we are calling our essential services. Um, and a minimum acceptable service level is defined by our service delivery policy, which is our public policy um, available on our website. Uh, that was approved by our board in 2017 that defines several service levels based on hours of operations. So when things start or end, the frequency, so how often trains and buses come and crowding or how many people should be on a vehicle at any one time. Um, and so based on two dimensions, the first dimension there on the left-hand side, ridership. So if things were had higher ridership pre-COVID and also had retained a proportion of their riders throughout the pandemic, we took that to be indicative that this was an essential service and was more likely to be serving essential workers. And a question of the demographics of who is riding. So high transit critical versus low transit critical or less transit critical was uh, a combination of factors in looking at how much of this mode served riders who were people of color, low income, from zero or one car households, um, people with disabilities and seniors. And the combination of those two essentially forms that top left box, which we defined as our essential services. And again, 
That's all of our rapid transit, blue, orange, red, green, and Mattapan. Many of our bus routes, just about 80, so about half our bus routes, and the Fairmont commuter rail line. All the other services we defined as non-essential, which is not to say that they're not important and not to say there are people who don't depend on them, but that we were okay with potentially reducing the frequency to better match ridership on those routes and modes versus that top left box that no matter what we wanted to make sure stayed at the very least at the service delivery policy standards. So that's essentially the forging ahead framework is trying to lead with transit criticality to determine where to maintain our service delivery policy and where we would potentially reduce service to a lower amount to better match existing ridership. Um, just a little more about than the service we plan to run uh, in the, week, the spring is it, for many people who are using essential services, again, that top left box, service should continue to look very similar to pre-COVID. Um, and as we go through, we'll, we'll highlight some of that. So for example, on the red line, we are reducing frequency by 20% um, throughout the day. But when we actually look at the schedules, that really only means that people will be waiting for one to three more minutes on average for a train. So it's still a very high level of service. Um, second, uh, based on our analysis uh, and due to the lower ridership, and you can see it, it's still even below where we were in September and October, we do not expect these service reductions to significantly increase crowding. Um, and again, those the, that third bullet point, the essential services that will be at or above our service delivery policy will be the Fairmont line, all of our rapid transit, bus routes, and the ride with some policy changes. And we'll be do, running a reduced level on um, the commuter rail uh, by reducing peak and midday service, weekday service ending earlier, and no weekend service on some lines, and then some reduced frequency on the remaining bus routes, the non-essential bus routes, uh, and a smaller survey area with some suspended routes, and as well as some consolidated bus routes. And I'll pause for a second to let Don catch up with me. Great. Uh, and then to call it out explicitly, because I know this may be top of mind for, for many of the people here tonight, um, the MBTA, after the December 14th vote by the board to approve these changes on a contingent basis, uh, did receive another $300 million in federal funding known as CARES II. Um, and these funds are being used by the MBTA to reimburse 100% of operating expenses. We are then, those are then essentially offsetting um, the equivalent form of net revenue, which we are using through forging ahead to apply, uh, using the same process as forging ahead to think about applying to both service, some capital, uh, and non-service operating costs. And the service in particular is ensuring that we will continue to run commuter rail um, post 9 p.m., which was originally what we voted on on December 14th, as well as offsetting uh, many of the bus frequency changes. So we're likely only implementing one third to about half of those changes. Um, and the, the remainder really of that capital is the recognition that we were originally allocating nearly 460 million from our capital budget uh, using that money to for preventative maintenance. Um, and instead we're returning about 179 million uh, to the capital program, thanks to the CARES II funding to help ensure that we are doing critical work. So I will now go through the, the specific mode changes, um, starting with the subway system. So the spring 2020 subways changes, um, the frequency will be reduced on the green line, orange line, and red line by 20%. Um, there will be no changes to the hours of operation. And we are not um, reducing, we are not stopping the green line at Brigham Circle as was originally proposed. The, the E line will continue to operate all the way to Heath Street. Um, so again, 20% sounds like a lot, but we've listed here some examples by line what that will mean in terms of times between trains or, or headways. So for example, on the red line, the weekday peak uh, is currently about nine every nine minutes if you're on the branches. So that's between Ashmont and JFK or Braintree and JFK. Uh, and that's gonna go to 11 minutes. So two minutes longer. 
And then in the trunk, which is what we call uh, JFK to alewife, it will go from roughly four and a half minutes to five and a half minutes. Uh, in the midday, uh, again, if you're on the branches, they'll go from 14 to 16 minutes and from every seven to every eight minutes on the trunk. So again, one to two to three minutes more, more um, time, potentially waiting for trains. On the orange line, uh, it will go from every seven minutes in peak to every eight minutes in peak, and from every nine minutes to every 11 minutes in the midday. And on the green line, there'll be some variation by branch, but we'll go from currently every six to eight minutes in the peaks to every seven to 10 minutes um, in the peaks. And again, those are the branches, not that, not that downtown core. Uh, and the uh, midday will go from about every seven to eight to every nine to 10 minutes. On the blue line, and again, the blue line reductions are significantly less than the other rapid transit because it's had much more durable ridership. Um, we are reducing frequency by about 5%, but it will vary by day. So we're reducing the peak a little bit in the really the original peak of the peak where we've seen lower ridership. So around that, that 8 to 9 a.m. and um, the uh, traditional peak around 5. Uh, and instead, we are actually though adding more service to the blue line in the afternoon where we've seen more durable ridership. So uh, the blue line you can almost imagine rather than being very peaky is beginning to move to something a little more smooth throughout the day. Uh, and folks can visit www.mbta.com slash schedules slash subway uh, to view the subway schedules once they're available online in late February, which should be very soon. And I'll talk through the bus changes. So as we go into this, really important to say that on top of all the changes, we will still be running nearly 90% of all pre-COVID bus service hours. Um, so the service may look different and it's in different parts of the city, but or cities, we are still running roughly 90% of all bus service. So there is one route where we are increasing frequency, that's the 236. And there are several routes where we're reducing frequency. And again, the schedule should be available online in the next week or so. And the routes that we're reducing frequency, that's the 10, 11, 21, 29, 31, 39, 47, 61, 71, 73, 77, 89, 93, 96, 101, 112, 134, 220, 222, 225, 501 and 504. There are also some routes where we are parts of the day they're seeing increased frequency and some of them are seeing reduced frequency and that's the route 1, 16, 32, 57 and 70. And there are eight additional routes that will be suspended as of March 14th. Uh, and that's routes 18, 52, 55, 68, 79, 212, 221, 465, and 710. Uh, and if you believe your route or stop is infected, uh, we strongly encourage you to use the MBTA trip planner to plan for alternative service. Um, many of these have alternative options within a quarter or half mile. Some of them do not. And again, these changes will go into effect March 14th. Uh, and then uh, secondly, um, we are also consolidating some routes. So the route will be the 24 and the 27, uh, the 136 and the 137, the 214 and the 216, and the 217 is uh, going to be somewhat consolidated and serve some of the gaps left by the 212. There are three routes we are changing their hours of operation. So they'll be operating peak only. That's the 67, 85, and 131. There are two routes with some routing changes. So um, we may not be operating all the variants or particular routing. Um, Path, so please check the schedules, and that's the 211 and the 435. And there are a series of routes where they have specific trip changes. So if you rely on the 705 AM, your trip might be becoming 715 or 655. So we strongly encourage you also to check the schedules 
and that's roots 9, 19, 36, 42, 45, 60, 80, 105, 108, 202, and 240. And then importantly, I, I, I do want to make sure we, we state clearly that we are still operating our, our buses at the COVID or trying to the our planning standard of, um, of crowding. So that's that reduced crowding and trying to plan for many fewer people on each bus. Um, and on that note, critically knowing that even with the spring changes, nearly 80, which is about half of our bus routes, will continue to operate at, at or close to pre-COVID service levels. And more than 20, so again, more than 20 bus routes will continue to operate at higher than pre-COVID service levels. And these are often our routes where we have seen the most durable and highest ridership throughout the pandemic. And that's including route 16, 22, 23, 28, 104, 106, 109, 111, 116, 117, and several more. Um, and similar to last spring, we are trying to preserve some service hours uh, and basically we have bus operators who can, um, if we have routes that have crowding or times of day, um, or we have some ability to respond real time uh, or over the course of a week to ensure that if there's routinely a place that's seen crowding, we can try to run more service with that. So as again, as ridership patterns are changing and folks come back, um, we have some ability to respond. And then finally on the bus, um, knowing that we are working very closely with Boston Public Schools as they are returning to a hybrid model this March, phased over March and April. Um, we, working with BPS, believe that BPS students are most likely to be impacted by the suspension of the routes 18 and 55. Uh, and BPS transportation will be mailing letters and reaching out to families who are potentially impacted to make sure they're notified and have support in providing and finding alternative service. Um, really critical here too, ensuring that folks know that there are resources to help them find the best alternatives if their route was impacted. Um, and that the BPS transportation also has a transportation hotline and other ways you can reach out to them with questions about how you may be impacted. Their transportation hotline number is 617-635-9520. Um, and the team is letting me know that the emails actually went out today and mailers later this week. So for those of you who are BPS parents or um, caregiving for a BPS student. Great. I'm now gonna hand over to Rob to talk through the commuter app. So Rob, I'm happy to drive the slides for you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Kat. Um, and thank you for that introduction. And thank you to everyone who's out there listening and joining us tonight for taking your time to talk about our spring schedule changes. Um, I will be talking about the upcoming commuter rail changes. As Kat noted earlier, we did institute some changes, especially by um, limiting or reducing, eliminating week, week end service on a couple of lines that started on January 25th. But this is to talk about what we're doing um, come April 5th on the commuter rail. And what we've done is given the changes in ridership patterns, you're see, we're seeing throughout the network where there's a little less of a traditional kind of large peak where we would traditionally the commuter rail would focus on bringing a lot of people in mostly into the Boston area um, for the morning rush and mostly home in the evening rush. We were very much a peak um, service oriented um, mode. And Based on some of the changes, we're trying to tailor our service to maybe better meet the demands of where we think the riders are today and where they may be for the foreseeable future by flattening out that peak a little bit and providing more of an all day service with a higher frequency in the off peak and a clock phase service where possible. And clock phase meaning that um, the train would come at a consistent time every day um, so for example, in Ayer, the plan is going to be that at 4.53 in the morning and 5.53 and 6.53 and all throughout the day, there'll be a train coming to Ayer station. So you won't even really, today, you, know, you might be looking at your schedule, trying to remember, is it 7.11, is it, is it 7.18, is it changed, is it not changed? 
uh, or telling a friend how to use the service. And, you know, and, and where we've been able to do it, we want to move to this clock phase service. So you can count on, again, I'm using air as an example, um, you know, if you say, say to your friend, hey, the 753, there'll be a train at the platform. So where we've been able to institute that clock phase service, we have done so. Um, we've done probably a little bit more on the north side than the south side right now, but we will continue to refine those things. Um, so we've also maintained an evening service. Originally, the idea was to potentially stop service at nine o'clock at night, but we've heard from many people and we know there is a demand for um, hospital workers, other, um, other essential services to have a later service. And so we have been able to keep um, that late night service. And we do think that this will give us a good base schedule. And part of the goal of this schedule is to have something that's a bit modular that as demand comes back, we can add in trips. Um, and so this is, it, we, we think we can build off of this schedule. Um, and it does reduce operating costs, which is not unimportant in this time where we are seeing revenue challenges, um, reducing operating costs is, is um, also an important goal. Um, next slide, please, Kat. So as I noted on the previously, um, what we're trying to do is maximize the efficiency where we can run many more trains at a, actually at a lower cost, which we spread out throughout the day. And you can sort of see on the chart on the right, this notion of, um, of not focusing you know, fewer peak trains, more all day service. And so if you're gonna be coming in, you know, maybe to a business meeting at 10 in the morning, maybe we didn't always have a schedule that would get you in perfectly and get you home in a way that you would think of the commuter rail being your first choice. We're trying to move in towards, in, in the direction of a regional rail network that perhaps that trip does now work for you, that we have a really good train that goes in at 10.05 and then maybe comes back at 105 and you can do your business and, um, and come back. So we think that this does um, maybe meet to, to the different service level needs and the different travel patterns that we're seeing. Um, just to give some comparisons, um, we're using the, ro the rolling stock about 18% better, meaning we're using fewer, um, fewer trains. Um, we're, we're running fewer overall trains, 11% fewer trains overall. This is compared to fall of 2019. We're running 505 trains every day. We're running 24% fewer vehicle miles and 20% less operator hours. So we're getting, again, we're getting more efficiencies out of the, um, out of the service. Um, so we're basically able to run 11% fewer trains, but with fewer vehicle miles and um, fewer operator hours by having a more efficient use of the crew and the, um, the train sets. Um, next slide, please, Kat. As I noted earlier, we did hear consistently that there was a demand to, to maintain a late night service to the extent possible. Um, and we know that is an important element of the services and the, and the needs for people. And so we were able to, by, by drawing out some of the efficiencies I mentioned, we were able to keep a later service where on every line, the last train will be leaving Boston around 11. Again, please note that these, these everything can't leave at 11. Things get staggered out of, out of North and South Station. Um, so we will have the final schedules shortly, but there'll be a train that will leave um, leave Boston right around 11, hitting all of the destinations. Um, we did look at running a kind of a sweeper bus type shuttle, um, but it really wasn't very efficient. It actually was costly and we're not sure it really could hit all the stations the way we wanted to. So we thought this was the better plan. Um, one thing I will note that unlike how we normally or, or, or traditionally ran the service in the past, um, there are three lines where you will take it, you will get a connection if, depending on where you're going. So if, for example, if you go into Newburyport on that last train, you'll get on the Rockport train and if Beverly, you'll switch, the train will go onto Rockport and you'll get on a train that goes up to Newburyport. So there are, um, there's an example in Kingston and Needham as well. So those are things to, for people just to be aware of that there will be a transfer for people making that last train out of Boston if they're going to either Needham, Newburyport or Kingston they'll get on a Providence, Rockport, or Middleborough train. Uh, next slide, please, Kat. Um, so the, as you said, the new schedule will be implemented on April 5th. Um, we think that this is a really great chance to have a way to, to attract maybe some new riders and some new travel patterns. Um, we think that this is a good baseline that will give us the foundation for additional um, capacity and services in the future. And we'll be starting a marketing and um, an additional awareness campaign um, very shortly. And um, just because I do want to point out that, that um, 
as Kat was mentioning, essential services and, and key areas. You know, one thing that comes out of this um, new schedule is we will be running 85% more Fairmont trains that we're running in fall of 2019. And there'll be a train to Beverly going through Lynn every half hour, except for twice a, a day when we need some windows for some maintenance work. So we are trying to prioritize um, areas where we've seen um, um, very steady ridership and um, where we think we have that transit critical need. Um, next slide, please. Um, one thing I do also want to point out starting um, this week or starting on March 1st um, going, and going to May 2nd, we will be doing a shutdown of the, um, of the Fitchburg line out to Littleton. So there'll be trains from Littleton West, but there'll be a bus shuttle that comes from Littleton, either out to Littleton or from Littleton in. Um, so if you are a rider um, getting on, you would get off in Littleton or if Littleton's your starting point, you'd be there. And there'll be an express bus, Littleton South Acton, then express into Alewife. Um, and there'll be a local bus that hits all of the stops, the West Concord, the Concord, the Lincolns, et cetera, in. Um, we will have um, sufficient buses to make sure that we, we can meet demand. And if in the first week we do see that we need any additional buses or additional services, um, we've already talked to the providers and our bus team is ready to add as, add as necessary if, if necessary. So we are very much ready. We've done a number of these um, um, shutdowns, you, often more often on the weekends, on the weekdays, but this is an opportunity to um, fully shut down the line and um, get a huge head start on installing um, a, a federally mandated safety technology um, on, on, on the Fitchburg line. So um, as I said, there'll be the local shuttle and the express shuttle, and we will be monitoring very carefully to make sure that we are able to serve everyone's needs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just so you know, Fitchburg cu um, customers do not pay for the bus shuttle or train service between Fitchburg and Littleton. Customers do pay a fare um, for the Red Line and Alewife. All the shuttle buses are accessible. Um, all shuttles are scheduled to meet commuter rail departure and arrival times at Littleton. Um, and customers should consult the updated schedule for shuttle departure times. So we've been getting the information out there. Um, but we recommend people you do continue to monitor the information if they are Fitchburg line riders and they'll be utilizing the shuttle for the next um, two months. And with that, I will turn it back to Kat. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for joining tonight. Great, so I will now, uh, just two or three more slides and then we'll open for questions. I uh, just wanted to cover the ride, our paratransit division. Um, so the ride, uh, because the ride system is based on the fixed route system, when we make changes to the fixed route system, there will be some impacts to the ride. So overall, though, very key to say that the overall geographic service area for the ride is not changing. Um, if people are eligible for the ride today, even though we are changing some of the fixed route service, they will still be eligible for the ride um, the, the following day. Uh, the change is rather going to be that there are some trips right now that are ADA trips because they're within three quarters of a mile of the fixed route system, uh, uh, but they will become premium trips, uh, thus complementing the changes on the fixed routes. Uh, furthermore, um, to the third point of the premium service hours will be adjusted to complement the changes on the commuter rail hours of operation on April 5th. Um, and that also the scheduling window, which is um, the time from request um, request time rather will become 40 minutes instead of the current 30 minutes. Uh, and all ride customers who would be impacted will be notified in advance of these changes uh, via the US mail, seat drops, media, et cetera. And then finally, our, our next steps. So we had a public meeting last Wednesday uh, and this Wednesday um, on the upcoming changes. Throughout February and March, uh, we are going to be sharing content on these changes via our, all of our platforms. Uh, and I believe some of the bus changes, the signage is already going up at the bus stops. Um, and then again, on March 14th, the bus and subway changes will go into effect and some of the ride changes. And then on April 5th, the new commuter rail schedules will go into effect. Um, and uh, that will also have some ride impacts. Um, and then throughout March and May, we're going to continue to review ridership, where we see crowding, um, public feedback, internal feedback from our operators and team, 
and use that to recommend when and how we re-add service for the summer and fall and beyond. Uh, and again, uh, hoping to do so in, in close coordination with rail vision and bus uh, and rail transformation and bus network redesign. Uh, so with that, thank you again, everyone for, for taking the time to listen. Um, I will now hand it back over for Q&A. Thanks, Kat. Um, right now, I'm going to go over uh, the, uh, the, the, how we're going to proceed with the rest of the questions tonight. Um, so questions can be submitted via the chat pod. While we may not get to all questions, all comments are part of the meeting record and will be shared with the MBTA leadership. To make a comment aloud, you must virtually raise your hand. To do this on the computer, you, uh, you can press uh, Alt-Y or click raise the raise hand button at the bottom center of your screen. On a mobile device, tap the raise to tap the uh, hand raise button uh, in the bottom center of your screen. Uh, on the phone, please dial star nine. Once, you're, once you raise your hand, you'll be added to a queue with others who have raised their hands. I will call on folks uh, on a first come first serve basis. When it is your turn to speak, I will say your last name or the last four digits of your phone number. And let, them, and let you know that I will be unmuting you. If you're on a computer or mobile device, a box will pop up at the center of your screen. You will need to confirm that you will like to be unmuted before you begin speaking. If you're on the phone, an automated recording will let you know that you are unmuted. You may speak as soon as the recording finishes. Once you're unmuted, everyone in the meeting can hear you. Before making your comment, Please slowly state your name and any organizational affiliation. Please remember to speak slowly as we have interpreters working with us this evening. So we ask that you please limit all comments to no more than two minutes. We ask that you only make one comment so that everyone, to ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak. As soon as you're finished, you will be muted again. Uh, and with that, uh, I am going to go look at the raised hands and I see here um, Representative Jim Hawkins um, has uh, uh, raised his hand. And Representative, I'm going to ask to unmute you now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Angel. Uh, and thank you, to everybody that's made this presentation. Uh, I'm, the, I'm Jim Hawkins. I'm the state rep from Attleboro. Uh, and we have just exploded with growth because we have two train stations. There's three new high rise apartments, all the mill buildings are getting converted to apartments. This is incredible growth. Uh, so all, all, everything that MBTA really, really matters to our district. And I can only tell you how impressed I am with your forging ahead and before that with the rail vision study, how much, how much time you spend listening to your, to, to your riders and, and how, how your services affect them. You've done an awesome job and I just, no, no question, I just wanna compliment you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, much appreciated. Uh, next, I am going to ask to unmute uh, Julian Wang. Uh, I'm gonna ask to unmute you now. Hello, uh, and uh, I thank the T for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to comment. Uh, Julian Wang, uh, no affiliation, uh, Quincy resident, but uh, I understand uh, the challenges that the T has had to navigate in uh, dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, but with that being said, uh, I do have a couple questions on uh, how uh, they approached the community rail uh, all day modeling and whether or not some of that can be um, expressed in the rapid transit scheduling as well with the uh, more distributed uh, uh, frequencies across maybe fewer day parts. So just the AM peak and then maybe the rest of the day and then a couple of fringe service periods for early morning, late night. Um, whether that would uh, be more equitable or would that save uh, operate uh, on operation costs um, and uh, I and a point of clarification I want to ask uh, this is 20 percent uh, the 20 percent figure is on frequency and not on the total number of trips is that correct oh one second um 
Kat? Yeah, so I can jump in and, and two questions that I might ask Melissa, who is our Senior Director of Planning and Scheduling, can jump in as well. Um, so on the, on the latter question of um, frequency versus trips, you are right that it is frequency. It is a proxy for trips, um, but in many times the total trip time is not only the time to go from station to station, but also how long the train is sitting in a station, um, which we call dwell time. With fewer, fewer riders, um, the time trains have been spending in stations is, is less on average. So the trains are actually making their loops much faster somewhat faster. So in some areas, um, the frequency may be down, but they're, they're, um, we're actually might have- The total journey time would not be that much different. It'd be a, a little faster. And so in some cases, I think we've actually- um, to uh, say Including that, wait time is what I'm saying. Yes, potentially, potentially. And so I think on the rapid transit side, like I said, I think 20%, it, it sounds, much worse than I think it will actually be, especially on the red and orange line um, where we have a lot of capacity right now. Um, we're pretty confident we will not see crowding and one to three minutes um, we think is increased, is still well within our service delivery policy. To your, to your question about um, thinking about moving to more of an all day system, I think we've still seen peaks on rapid transit and the green line, um, excuse me, on the red, orange line and green line and blue line. Uh, we don't have quite the same operational limitations um, that the commuter rail has. And I think already we're having, mm, I, I don't wanna get out of school and speak here is like, but I think largely saying, I think ridership and we have the ability to look at ridership throughout the day and as the riders themselves are, are potentially shifting to different patterns and how people are using um, public transit is I think a chance for us to say, maybe we wanna to move to someday a world where yes, it is the same frequency on the red line all day, every single day, um, but we're not there yet. But I think particularly in the blue line, you can see that we're, we've started reducing the peaks, but adding in the off peak. So I think definitely open to exploring and, and thinking about that as we start restoring service is also as the future of telework, the future of transportation, and definitely have the, the ability to rethink it as well. So a bit of a long-winded answer, um, but I, I hope that helps. Definitely. Melissa, anything That's you want to add to that? No, I think you had that. Well, uh, Kate and Melissa, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to your team as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to mute uh, Mr. Matthew Hardy. Uh, I'm going to ask to mute you now. Mr. Hardy. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Matthew Hardy. Uh, thank you so much for, for having this uh, virtual meeting today. I really appreciate it. I think it, I think you guys have done a really good job explaining everything and especially the funding aspect. It's obviously something that you don't read about in the newspapers. Um, but first off, I wanna talk about, I, I, I take the commuter rail. I've, I've taken the commuter rail all throughout the uh, pandemic. Uh, I'm considered essential in my job. So I take the Franklin line, I get on in uh, Endicott, Dedham, and I take it to Back Bay every single day. Um, I've had no issues whatsoever with the service. I completely understood when you changed the service a few times during the spring and summer, and even in the fall, uh, if I've had a bit of a gripe, it's been in the winter service. I understood why you did it due to the low volume and ridership. And I know you explained that further. Um, however, I've noticed since January, maybe mid-January, um, there's been a lot more people on the train. And as somebody who has observed taking the commuter rail um, for the last you know, year, this has been the least safe I've felt. Um, unsafe, I felt. I, I, you know, it's starting to crowd up. Um, uh, there's, you know, your, I, I was always maybe a few seats from everyone, even at certain peaks during the summertime. Now I'm going to see the way. Uh, I think the conductors do the best job they can do. However, I feel there's still, you know, some fellow uh, commuters that are not exactly being following the protocols with, you know, their masks 
below their nose and a few times even wearing chin diapers below their chin. Um, and, you know, as somebody who's a writer, I, I, I've been feeling a little antsy and I, this has really been happening since the change. And, you know, uh, the, 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 I get on the train at 723 in the morning and unfortunately the next train's not till 930. And I feel like, and I understand, I don't know what the, the service is going to be for April, but I think if there was another train somewhere between 830, I think that would improve things a little bit more. Um, and and, and this, this is not me, just me saying this. This is also fellow people at my train stop at Endicott and then other people, colleagues who I work with who have also witnessed this. A few of them are now driving in and unfortunately paying those, you know, very expensive parking uh, passes each day. Um, I just want to know, you know, how you surveys this because I did see some of the... Um, train surveyors around Thanksgiving week, which I think was not probably the best week to get a good survey as, you know, a lot of less people were using the train during that period of time, maybe taking time off. Um, but uh, I'm sure you guys would probably explain that a little bit better and probably give me a little more insight to what you expect in April, because I know several businesses, especially in my work, where as our capacity is going to grow as there's more vaccines given out, uh, what, what would we expect from these uh, commuter rail uh, ridership? Thank you, Mr. Hardy. Uh, Rob, I don't know if there, if there was anything you'd like to add to that. No, I do appreciate your pointing out, um, you know, obviously in, in around Thanksgiving due to some COVID challenges, we did reduce the number of trains we were running. Um, because we did have some critical areas where we, we, were, we were having some staffing challenges, you know, the surge hit us the way it kind of hit, unfortunately, the whole, most, a lot of the Commonwealth. Um, I think that, and so we did reduce um, service in the kind of mid-December timeframe um, that, we could, that we could run, um, you know, consistently and everything else. So I do hear what you're saying, and I appreciate that. We do have line managers who are supposed to be out there making sure to be watching for potential crowding to see if we do need to add back capacity. Um, we'll say the April 5th schedule, there'll be four trains leaving Endicott between kind of 720 and 850. So I think that right now, you know, right now, we, we, there are not that many trains, as you, as you noted. And so people are um, tending to you know, gravitate towards the train that works for their schedule. I think that by adding, by adding back service, um, like I said, we'll be adding back a fair amount of service in the April schedule, and we hope that that will help spread people out. But we do um, we do ask people if they do see you know, passengers, you know, to to tweet us or contact us, and and we do have um, and and we can either look to remind conductors um, and or to add capacity if we do see certain trains that are getting particularly um, particularly crowded. We do have you know ability to add coaches here and there. We can't solve all the problems, I think, but I think you will see with the new schedule simply having more trains out during those times. Hopefully we'll start spreading out that ridership. Thanks, Rob. Um, uh, I hope that uh, uh, that answers um, uh, his questions. Uh, next, I'm going to ask to mute uh, Mr. Andrew Glass. Just a reminder to folks to just try to keep uh, our questions and comments uh, to two minutes um, so that we uh, we can get to as many people as possible tonight. Uh, next, I'm going to. Uh, Ask Mr. Andrew Glass to unmute. Uh, Mr. Glass. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, and and thank you everybody for this excellent presentation. Um, I'm the I, a Lincoln resident, a commuter rail user, and the representative from Lincoln to the MBTA Advisory Committee. Um, I had a question about a commitment to restoring weekend service on commuter rail, and my question really relates. Um, to both the Commonwealth's commitment to smart growth around uh, commuter rail stations, of which is a you know, topic of a recent uh, uh, legislation that was passed into law, uh, and the fact that many essential workers um, have schedules that span weekends and don't have often easy access, uh, particularly in gateway communities that commuter rail serves uh, to uh, alternative forms of transportation. 
Um, so I'd like to hear about plans for um, ensuring access to commuter rail on weekends, um, particularly as we come out of, uh, while we're in COVID and also as we come out of COVID um, and uh, the, so that we can ensure that essential workers have access uh, to the downtown core where many of the jobs are located, as well as guaranteeing that development that is encouraged to occur around commuter rail stations um, has uh, access uh, for all uh, week, uh, not only weekdays, but also weekends. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glass. Uh, Rob, I didn't know if you wanted to take a stab at uh, trying to answer that question. No, I think that we've been we've been trying to say I think in, on all the modes, and Kat would agree that that we we will be monitoring closely. We do work with a lot of the employers. Um, we actually will be watching kind of crowding on the highways and trying to use a whole bunch of different tools to determine when the best time to bring back services are. Um, and yeah, you know, we obviously we, we do appreciate public feedback on where. People think we should be, you know, and we try to do. We try to be responsive as much as possible. So, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Glass, for your comments. And we really will be watching what we have, it, and we will be kind of again working with the business community and the and the employers um, to try to identify um, those needs as as they go as we go forward. Um, and I think on all the modes, we'll be trying our best to match the demand, the the service to the demand. Thanks, Rob. Um, next, I'm going to ask to unmute uh, Mr. Michael Espada. Mr. Espada, I'm asking to unmute you now. Yes, uh, I, I got a question. It, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I have a concern about the, 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 the Green Line, the new Green Line, I mean, uh, the Nishmere Station. Is, it, do you, do you know if they're going to extend the new Nishmer station to, to be terminated or, or are they going to extend to Union Square? So I can try to answer that, um, Mr. Espada. So, and we didn't talk about this explicitly here, but in case it's been on the minds for other folks, um, as part of the forging ahead process uh, last winter, um, not only did we, like I said, reducing services is the option of last resort. Uh, we also put on pause, not canceled, but very clearly paused a number of capital projects um, until we could reprioritize this spring as part of our capital improvement program, uh, investment program. Um, however, very critically, no projects that were currently under construction already were impacted, and that includes GLX. Um, so the GLX project is, is still funded and is still ongoing, um, and I cannot speak to the, the exact timelines, but the the GLX project has not been affected by forging ahead, though, like all workforces, I'm sure they're being impacted by COVID uh, as well. But that is that is still said and the work is still ongoing and GLX is still planned to open first to Union Square and then up to up to Tufts. Thank you, Kat. Uh, next, I'm gonna ask to unmute Andy, uh, Reeker, I uh, believe, I, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. I'm asking to unmute you now. Thank you. Yes, you did get the last name right. Um, it's kind of confusing. It could be read multiple ways. So I appreciate that. Um, my name is Andy Reeker. I work for the city of Cambridge. And um, I'm actually just going to read a statement um, on behalf of our city manager. Um, you know, I think uh, we've uh, had a chance to process, I think, the MBTA's proposals and, you know, I think our statements from December during the earlier part of the forging ahead process continue to remain, you know, the concerns that we identified at that point. Um, in particular, I just wanted to, you know, comment specifically on behalf of the city about the suspension of the Route 68. We continue to believe that this suspension is inequitable and would create a significant hardship for many bus users in Cambridge. Um, especially based on the impacts to low-income families, communities of color in Cambridge, and then in particular to students at the city's only public high school. Um, you know, I think for folks who may know Broadway in Cambridge, um, which is um, where the Route 68 runs, it goes between Harvard and Kendall Squares, and many important destinations are on Broadway, including the Cambridge Ringe and Latin School, 
the city's only public high school, the main branch of the public library, and the public housing for uh, families in the Port and Wellington Harrington neighborhoods. Um, specifically, there are you know hundreds of low-income households in the Cambridge Housing Authority um, uh, complexes at Washington Elm and New Newtown Court. Um, we also just note that the Port neighborhood is also one of the few in Cambridge that is considered by the Commonwealth to have two environmental justice populations, that is communities of color and low-income households. Um, you know, in particular, where our main concern about this suspension is I'm really focused on the Cambridge public high schoolers. The MBTA uh, provides, you know, critical, safe, and reliable travel um, for a lot of these high school students, and the Route 68 is actually one of the most critical for the school. Um, you know, we are, uh, we know, we've noted that the MBTA provides specifically um, specially operated supplemental bus service on Route 75 serving Western Cambridge, um, but that many of our transit dependent households um, with students that go to Cambridge Ridge and Latin are on Route 68, 69, and 83. Um, and so we, you know, kind of have felt uh, up until maybe the last uh, few days or the last few weeks that the MBTA may not be aware that while CRLS has been operating in a hybrid schedule, um, they plan to increase the attendance of students there up to 450 students on weekdays um, and will continue to add more students on site. Um, so, you know, we understand how difficult the situation is. The coronavirus pandemic has resulted in so many people having to um, sacrifice so many things over the course of the past I hate to say almost 12 months, um, but you know we really do feel in this situation that the um, MBTA must continue to support the critical, safe, and reliable travel for our environmental justice, justice communities in Cambridge, and very specifically to the students at CRLS. So we hope to continue um, as Cambridge staff in conversation with you all, um, but we just wanted to make a statement tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh uh, Kat uh, or Melissa, I don't know if there was, um, uh, if we wanted to respond to that. Um, I know that we've got received a letter today regarding that. We will be responding, uh, but I don't know if there was any additional comments we wanted to make to it. Yeah, I uh, I know that we've, we've actually been working closely with the city of Cambridge. Um, I don't know, Melissa, if you want to speak briefly to that. I was actually uh, in contact with folks from Cambridge Engine Latin. Um, because with the Route 68, some of the former um, most heavily used trips back in the pre-COVID ridership numbers that we had were surrounding the school travel times. So uh, one of the things that we're looking at doing for the spring, since we recognize that um, Cambridge has recently announced that uh, CRLS is going back for in-person starting uh, March 1st, is that we're looking to um, figure out how we can operate the 733 morning trip that gets folks to school in time and also have a, a 1230 afternoon trip to get folks back home uh, uh, after the, the school's modified release time. And then similarly, uh, we're, we're looking to um, maintain the afternoon service. Uh, we had a little bit of a hiccup with, they actually shifted their uh, afternoon release uh, earlier. So instead of uh, being positioned to use the trips that we have that go to um, Ringe Ave and uh, Lechmere on the 83 bus and the 69, uh, we, we, we are able to uh, shift those trips earlier to meet their modified 12.30 uh, release time. So we've been working very closely with Cambridge, Ringe, and Latin, and I think we have a, a good plan figured out for the remainder of the spring. Thank you, Melissa. Um, right now, I, uh, I'm going to, uh, there were some questions that were in the chat that were brought up by some individuals. Uh, I'm gonna uh, read some of these questions aloud and see if we can provide some answers and clarity for folks. Uh, the first question that I see is, when will these specific uh, new commuter rail schedules be available? Uh, um, uh, Rob, I don't know if you wanted to take a stab at, at answering that, if we provide some estimate. I think our goal is by the end of next week, Angel, but I, I don't, I, that's a goal. It could, it could you know, I think we definitely want within 30 days, but, but um, there is still a little bit more work that they have to do to actually validate the schedules, you know, the, it is down to the minute, and so um. They are, they are working on them as we speak. They want to make sure they kind of got approved in concept last week by the board. So, but they will be available. We, we definitely want to give people a couple of weeks before we go into April um, to digest the new schedules. Thanks, Rob. And that, that is past, that is a keeping with past practice for folks 
we usually get people, um, uh, our customers and riders, um, uh, as much time as possible when it comes uh, uh, to the schedule. Um, recognizing that the changes can can be significant in certain instances. Um, next um, question I am going to have here is, do essential routes take into account the increased number of people using high volume vaccination sites? Uh, and no matter where people live, they have to get to doctors and hospitals in Boston, no matter where they live. Not many people do not have cars or alternate transportation. Um, Andrew, do you want me to speak to that real quick? Sure. So I, I think it's a great question. I think there's um, probably two things to, to keep in mind. One is forging ahead in the process was done before we knew where the specific vaccination sites would be, so the mass vaccination sites. Um, but that being said, I think there are two key elements throughout the forging ahead process that I think that help potentially alleviate any challenges there. The first is that when we thought about what is transit critical, um, the, uh, the proportion or number of households with zero to, to uh, less than a, or one car or less um, per household was, was a key element in defining what is transit critical. So that was taken into account. Uh, and that too, throughout the pandemic, um, trying to keep a very close eye on access to medical centers, uh, ensure that we were continuing to provide that. Uh, and so, for example, one of the key pieces of feedback we heard through November and December was that by shortening the green line of Brigham Circle rather than running it all the way to Heath Street, we were actually making access to the VA medical center more challenging. It wasn't eliminating access, but it was making it more challenging. So that's one of the key reasons actually we're continuing to run the green line is to make sure we still have the access to that, to that area. I, um, so I think between those two things, I, I am, we are hopeful um, that we are alleviating that issue. Um, and then I think, uh, I don't wanna speak for uh, the ride, um, but I know they've also been trying to keep an eye on making sure that uh, ride eligible passengers as well are, are able to get to vaccination sites. Thanks, Kat. Um, the next question here is, uh, can you please talk a little bit about the travel, uh, about travel on the 217 changes? Um, uh, it's, uh, I guess I'll take a quick stab and Kat or Melissa, you could step in. But my understanding here is that the route will be modified to serve a portion of Billings Road uh, to substitute for the loss of the route at 212. That is uh, my understanding regarding the 217 changes. Melissa or Kat, is there any, anything else you want to add to that? No, you got it. All right. Uh, next, um, uh, we had a question regarding the Fitchburg line. For the Fitchburg line between March 1st and May 2nd, uh, should riders get a normal zone six pass to go into from Acton to Alewife? Sorry, is on mute there. Um, you know, Angel, I'm, let me, I, I, if that person could um, maybe submit that comment in writing, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't want to give a bad answer and I'm, I'm not sure I actually know the right answer right now. So, um, I know there are different venues to kind of get your questions into us. Um, and if someone can get us that question, I will definitely make sure that we respond directly. We'll, we'll privately yeah, uh, reach out to the individual um, and see if we can get there, if they can reach out to us and we'll connect afterwards, Rob. Yep. Uh, next, uh, service to Arlington has been cut severely. This will present hardships for many residents who rely on the public bus system to get to work and back home. What replacement services are going to be substituted in place of this reduction in service? Um, uh, I, I will take a stab at, at answering this. Uh, and then Kat and, and Melissa, uh, if you could uh, step in, if I do not get this correct. Uh, on the Route 69, for folks that are uh, impacted by this suspension, we asked them that they take the Route 77 or the red line as an alternative service. Uh, in addition to that, the 67, Route 67 uh, span changes um, uh, do not have any uh, other replacement options at the moment. Uh, I think, Kat? Yeah, I will defer to Melissa on if there's anything else she wants to add to the Arlington changes. No, you covered everything I would have said. Do I guess the, the thing I'd add there too is, um, and through the forging head process, right, we clearly, and there's obviously a balance to be struck 
we very clearly got the feedback. And again, this drove a lot of the changes for December that um, more important to preserve access where possible um, than necessarily frequency or, or span, that it was important to have some access um, versus sort of losing all access. So 79 and, and 67 riders, there's, there's still some access, though it might be a little further away, but trying to ensure that folks throughout the entire system um, be able to have some access and still conduct uh, their essential needs. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do one more question, and then we'll we'll take more questions from folks, and then we'll come back to some of these um, to some of these comments. There is a question in Spanish um, I, I, uh, that someone had asked. Uh, I would like to know that the blue line in Route 111 uh, uh, will not have changes in the schedule. Um, uh, the blue line has had very minor changes uh, in frequency, approximately five percent point for the spring. Um, uh, 2021 changes. There are no changes that are planned for the 111 bus, um, which uh, actually has now more service than it did pre-COVID um, uh, because of changes that we've made. So I hope that that answers that individual's question. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, to, uh, to ask Mr. Alex uh, Sosenik uh, uh, to um, to, to the floor, Mr. Susenik. Hey, good evening. Yeah, my name is Alex Sauchinets. I'm on the board of the Fenway Civic Association. Um, I believe uh, I've spoken to at least some of you in, in prior meetings. Um, so thanks for, uh, for having this uh, meeting tonight and thanks for the opportunity to comment. Um, I think um, the, the Fenway Civic Association really just wants to uh, comment in particular on the suspension of the Route 55 bus. Um, so I'm not sure how much of these changes is set in stone or, or could still be changed, um, but Fenway Civic would really like to, again, strongly urge the MBTA to, to reconsider the suspension of, of the Route 55. Um, another route, I think it was the 43, was initially slated for a suspension, but was then reversed. Um, and, and if at all possible, we would really like to see the 55 stay as well. Uh, the 55 is a, a vital route for the Fenway neighborhood. This is upwards of 40,000 people who are now having a primary mode of transport removed. Um, the West Fenway in particular has a really high concentration of vulnerable populations um, who really don't have other transport options. They're not gonna be able to uh, walk to the next closest uh, transport option. Uh, so, and vulnerable populations like this were brought up earlier in this meeting, um, stated as, as being particularly targeted by the MBTA to have as little disruption as possible. Um, and in fact, you know, it, it is really disrupting uh, a lot of those vulnerable people in this area. Uh, and, and really the, the whole Fenway population will be affected by this. The, the 55 was always very well used, you know, prior to the pandemic and, and losing this would be a, a big change for the neighborhood. Um, the other point that I wanna make is that the suspension of the 55 will also create uh, another logistical nightmare. Uh, the, the Fenway is being inundated right now with large development projects. Um, we, we are currently, um, uh, overseeing in, in this neighborhood almost 1.8 million new square feet of development. There's several new large apartment buildings, um, the huge new Red Sox music theater. <clears throat> um, and every single one of these projects um, is anticipating and relying on the 55 uh, for providing services um, to, to their customers, to their, their residents, uh, et cetera. So um, <clears throat> we, uh, we really would like to, again, uh, strongly urge uh, the reconsidering, um, eliminating the, the 55. Um, and I guess if, if I could pose one question, uh, the forging ahead plan doesn't really seem to um, allow for any mechanism to ever restore any of these routes that are being suspended. And I know obviously the terminology suspension is, is intended to, to indicate that it's temporary, but there doesn't really seem to be a way to uh, ever have this, this restored. So. Uh, if I could ask uh, a question is, how would we propose to the MBTA to have our service restored once these changes take effect? Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, Alex. I, I'm happy to give some, some quick comments there. Uh, and then we'll ask Melissa if she wants to jump in on, on some 55 comments, but particularly on the restoration is, uh, and this has come up repeatedly, and even last night in our MEPA hearing, um, I wish that we could give a very clear definition of saying 
when this route or this area hits this threshold, we will do X. Um, but in reality, it is a combination of factors of both the return of ridership, where the ridership is, the time of day of the ridership, and also the return of durable revenues. Um, so that is something that that conversation about the process by which we will start restoring service, I think VT wants to start having over the next few months and as part of our um, fiscal 22 budget cycle, which uh, just kicked off on Monday. Um, and the idea too, again, that uh, network redesign is a key element of that too, that knowing that why one of the reasons it's complicated is that we know we know ridership has fundamentally changed forever. And that we know the system, we will be doing a disservice to the entire system. And this is for all modes. If we just go back to what we were operating pre COVID and don't reflect the fact that um, travel patterns are different in terms of times of day, types of trips, who is traveling and making sure that we build back that we're doing as thoughtfully as possible in accordance with uh, bus network redesign and, and rail vision. And um, so I, I, I realize that is a disfact a dissatisfying answer, and I appreciate that, and I understand any frustration with that. Um, but it is, it is really, I think, something we want to think about and start talking about publicly going forward. And, and really, right now, I've been focusing on making sure at least folks have information about what's happening on March 14th, and then start talking about well, what's coming next. Um, Melissa, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add, particularly on service in the uh, in the in the uh, Route 55 area. I mean, we're we're starting to talk about, you know, how we can start thinking about service restorations, but it's it's probably only going to be partial restorations as we come into the fall, since we have a number of different um, limitations with what our budget looks like, uh, the number of operators that we're going to have available um, to us, and uh, actually one of the other things is that with some of the uh, changes that we've been making since COVID times, we've actually been investing some of those into increased frequency on some of those places that we've seen more crowding and the more durable ridership. So, so some of those resources are already being used for other things. So um, that's just part of the, the number of factors that we're considering as we think about how to build the system back. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next I'm gonna ask to unmute uh, Mr. Matthew Wong, Mr. Wong, I've asked to unmute you. Good evening. Um, my name is Matthew Wong. I'm a student at LaSalle University in Newton, Massachusetts, um, straight off, right off of the end of the green line. Um, I'm going, I have a comment and a question. Um, my first com my comment is related, related to the commuter rail. Um, I don't, unless I missed it, I don't, I don't think there was a specific I don't think weekend service was specifically addressed in the in the PowerPoint, um, but I'm going to assume that the weekend service suspensions are going to remain as they are now. And if so, I'd be I'm concerned about the Newburyport Rockport line in particular, because that line is one of the lines that still has weekend service, but yet at the same time, the entire Rockport branch is being shut down. Um, on the weekends. It supposedly it's for the Gloucester drawbridge, but I assume there's something else going on as well between Beverly and Manchester. But at the same time, there, you're, you're still running a Rockport train or trains for that matter, that's only going to Beverly. And I don't think that the, the demand between North Station and Beverly is that high, in the, especially in the winter, where you would need a separate so so-called Rockport train that's essentially a shuttle train to Beverly, in addition to all of the Newburyport trains that already make all of those stops between North Station and Beverly, like I, it just it just seems like a waste of resources to be running a, what's essentially a, a Beverly shuttle um, when when people trying to get to Beverly or anywhere between North Station and Beverly could do so via a Newburyport train, and so I wonder if some of those resources could be reallocated to provide weekend service on other lines that currently do not have weekend service. And then my question would be, is there any public record of the MBTA budget or their financial, other financial state anywhere? Like, is there any public, is there any place where we can see where, what the current budget is and where the different money is going towards? So like how much money is going toward capital improvements? How much money is going toward service restoration? How much money is going toward administrative expenses? Like, is there anywhere we can see that? Uh, I can handle that particular question. Uh, yes, Mr. Wong, you can you can find this information uh, on on our website mbta.com. 
Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can look up under leadership and FMCB, and you can look at every single document uh, relating to the MBTA finances, whether it's be our audits, uh, our pension system, uh, and any presentations that we've, that we've brought up to the board regarding our finances there. We're currently going through our FY22 budget process, and I'd like to just make a clarification on that, that this is our first year under a changed uh, change in state law last year that we secured, um, that we do not have to have our budget completed by April 15th, I believe was the date. We, uh, we now do not have to have that completed until the middle of June. Uh, and that it is in practice with what other agencies across state government um, uh, do. And so that's the reason we, uh, we seek that, uh, we sought that change from the legislature and it was granted. So um, that is, uh, that is uh, it's a little bit of a different budget process this year, but that's the reason why. So uh, yeah, if, um, if you go to mbta.com uh, on the FMCB portion of it, you should have all that information there. Um, next, I am going to ask to unmute uh, Ginny Fairley. I'm asking to unmute you now. Hi, thank you very much. Um, amazing, you said my name correctly. Uh, yes, I'm Jeannie Fairley. I'm the Americans with Disabilities Act coordinator for the city of Newton. Um, basically, uh, anything to do with uh, our residents with disabilities, uh, including transportation is primary uh, work of mine. I'm also a resident of Newton, a long time resident of Newton. Um, I have, uh, I am an alumna of the Carroll Center for the Blind. I am blind. I travel with a, a guide dog to help me uh, stay on the streets and cross safely. And I have uh, been a rider of bus 52 um, off and on over the last um, however many 40 years that I've been in Newton. I am very distressed that um, bus 52 has been, is, is slated to be suspended. Uh, it's one of two bus routes that have absolutely no alternative for public transportation. Um, I, I am positive that there is no bus route or T route uh, that is close enough to where uh, 52 used to be. It, um, it, it goes from, in case some people don't know, uh, Dedham to West Roxbury, all the way through Newton, south to north, um, into Watertown, into Watertown Square. It uh, serves, um, oh, I can't tell you how many schools it serves. It serves many, it, it serves our public high school, um, one of our public high schools, two middle schools, um, several private schools. Uh, and ultimately um, the one I'm most interested in is for our residents with disabilities, all disabilities, but especially those where they may not have um, any alternative transportation. They don't drive like myself. Um, they don't have any way of getting a, a, a ride or to work to the Carroll Center anywhere. It, it's just devastating um, to me and, and to um, the Carroll Center for the Blind where people learn how to take public transportation, but then there was a bus stop nearby and now they won't even know how to do that. Um, they'd be walking miles and miles of at least a, three, a mile and a quarter to two miles to, the, to another bus stop. Uh, of bus 59, but they do not, you know, they're, they're not within a half a mile is as your presentation said. So I'm, my first question is, are you mitigating any way uh, transportation for uh, people along that route, going to school, going to the Carroll Center, uh, staff that work at the Carroll Center are blind. Um, I, I saw that you had some mitigation possibilities for bus 68. I'd like to know what your uh, mitigation uh, or possibilities are uh, for bus 52. So, so I can jump into that, Jeannie. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, take them very seriously. And there are a number of thoughts. I think with the changes that are going to affect in March 14th, where we largely are now is thinking about um, the next, getting feedback for the next service changes, specifically summer or fall. Um, and I think for the Route 52 and, and a few other routes in the system too, there are some individuals being stranded. And you're right, that is, is more than a, a half mile away from MBTA services. We recognize that and it is a challenging situation for those individuals. And we recognize there are few to, to sometimes no alternatives for those individuals. I will say in a system-wide perspective, 
And I think overall the entire system, we are stranding fewer than 1500 individuals, which is less than 1% of our, our COVID ridership. And I realize for any single one of those individuals, that is a very significant impact. Um, on the 52 in particular, I will say that has definitely come up repeated times and it's something we're looking at very closely. And I think we've actually spoken to a number of, of your local representatives as well, our, our general manager has. And I think what we are, and it's probably actually most helpful right now, um, and I think uh, whether it's through Anthony or us following up after the fact, is understanding specifically what, um, when and what time of day trips are most helpful. One of the reasons the 52 was suspended was due to very, very low ridership during the pandemic, uh, especially versus pre-pandemic. Um, but trying to understand if there were trips to be restored, what times of day um, and, and what stops in particular would be most helpful. And that would be really, really helpful data, I think, to the team to think through as we restore and add service, um, where, where that might be and what options exist. So Angel or Anthony, Jeannie, I know, we, you are, uh, we know, we think we know you well, Petit, I'll make sure we follow up and I think that would be very helpful information to have. Yeah, we're happy to follow up um, uh, with Jeannie on that. Uh, I'm gonna just for a few minutes move over uh, on some questions uh, that folks um, uh, that folks had here. What time will be uh, the time, what will be the time the first train leaving Worcester to Boston during the week? Um, what well, time will be the first train leaving Worcester to Boston during the uh, during the week? Hospital workers need early trains. Currently, they do not get there early enough. Uh, and I believe we have an answer to that question. So bear with me one second. Um, the first uh, line departure uh, for winter 21, there's a 5.30 a.m. train that makes all stops um, and it gets into Boston at 7 a.m. I believe so I'm sorry, Angel, that's what that's what's running right now. The 530 that gets in at seven. There's going to be a 415 that's going to get in at with the spring schedule. Sorry, this is, I just said that there'll be a 415 that gets in at 550 to South Station. So obviously it gets to the hospitals earlier than that. And then there'll be an express train that leaves at five and we'll get to South Station at 621. So there'll be two opportunities to get in between you know, 545 and 630 in the morning. With the new schedules and that which take place which start in um april 5th thank you rob uh the next question that i see here um in spanish will we'll, what would be the changes for the 112 um and uh, i will take a stab uh based on the answers i've gotten here the frequency is getting reduced during parts of the day but there will still be more service than there was pre-COVID on the 112. Uh, there are uh, some recent pilot trips that will be added and are helping to keep crowding to, um, to reasonable levels on the 112 bus. Um, the next question I have here is, um, why was the 79, uh, why was the 79 bus uh, eliminated? And what will it be reinstated or substituted line to Alewife from Arlington Heights be instituted? Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Kat or, or Melissa, do you want to take a, a quick stab at answering that? I'm happy to repeat the question. Sure, I can start and then Melissa, if you want to add the. Um... Route 79, one of the, the lenses we looked at for routes was also where there's a redundancy of options. Um, and it was flagged for suspension, knowing there were some alternative routes, specifically the Route 77. Melissa, anything you want to add there? That's it. All right. Uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to um, folks. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Bob Coyne, who raised his hand. Uh, uh, and I'm going to ask to unmute him now. Mr. Cronin. Mr. Cronin, I've just asked to unmute you now. Seems that we might be having it. Oh, Mr. Cronin. Hello. 
Yes. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, my name is Bob Cronin. Um, um, I use the commuter rail, the Fitchburg line, and um, my closest station is uh, Silver Hill. And I've been asking the question, um, what cost saving does the MBT find by closing stations, particularly when trains still pass by these stations, um, these closed stations? And I uh, got um, uh, didn't get too many answers, um, but I, I finally did get an answer uh, a couple of days ago. And um, the answer was uh, the cost of maintenance uh, for the stations. Um, and uh, I would like to know what the real cost of maintenance is for a station like Silver Hill. Uh, I live right next to the Silver Hill station and I'm very aware of most of the maintenance that's done there. And over the last year, I think they painted a yellow line and um, they fixed a, a wooden fence and they plowed the station a couple of times for, um, for the snow. So is there a way I can find out what the real cost of maintenance is for this uh, station at Silver Hill? Mr. Cronin, I know you emailed us today and we have committed to getting back to responding to you to get you an answer to your question. Um, and, you know, it, it is, you know, the stations don't each come with their own maintenance budget. It's part of the bigger commuter contract bid. Um, the keel is maintained. And so it's it, pulling it out is, and there's a, there's a number of kind of ancillary benefits about, about like you said, there's the maintenance, there are um, crew runs in terms of getting trains in at different times. And so it, it's a, it's not kind of the most, you know, we don't we don't just pull out and say there's the dollar that we saved, um, but I and I do understand, you know, and I, I'm sure that if you lived right near the station, I'm sure it was a very convenient station to use. Um, so we do hear your your concern. I know you did email us earlier today, um, and we will be will be um, responding to you. Thank you. Okay, Rob. as long as thank you. Yep. Hello, Mr. Cronin. Yes. Yeah. Oh, they mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to say uh, thank you, and uh, I, I just want to see if we can uh, come to some understanding of, of what the maintenance cost is, and uh, and uh, you know we 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 feel as though that that's the main cost because the cost of fuel to stop at the station is is really kind of minimal, um, but um, and it, it only takes ninety seconds to stop at stop at the station. So I just want to uh, continue the conversation and see if we can work out something that would be beneficial for the Silver Hill community and the MBTA. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I am going to ask to unmute uh, uh, Jaja uh, Ayer. I'm going to ask to unmute you. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Jaya Ayer. Um, I'm the community organizer at Fenway CDC. Um, and I just, you know, wanted to express again, um, the kind of an echo on what other folks from the Fenway have said before, just the deep frustration um, about the 55 bus getting canceled, um, you know, not just for, um, not just for our community, but for the other um, areas of Boston that are served by the 55 bus, you know, thinking about BPS students, um, our seniors, um, disabled folks in the community. Um, this is a really critical bus line. Um, and it's frustrating to see that um, that timeline. I understand, you know, budgets work in complicated ways, but um, it's frustrating to see that there isn't really a defined um, uh, timeline in terms of like when services could resume or kind of thinking about more long-term the processes of advocating and getting service to resume for such a critical service like the 55. Um, our community desperately needs access. Um, the Fenway is going through one of many rounds of gentrification and um, intense high-speed development. Um, 
and folks are going to be moving into the neighborhood more than they're moving out. Um, and we want families, we want to preserve the diversity, the economic diversity, especially of the community. And, and so, you know, thinking about access to public bus, public bus and T is really critical to that. Um, and so just to emphasize and echo what other folks have said, um, we're really heartbroken and disheartened to see kind of the, the challenges in um, complete transparency um, in regards to the 55 and, and the other bus lines and that are being cut and impacted. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, those comments. Next, I'm gonna ask to unmute uh, Karen Fisher. Ask him to unmute you now. Hi. Um, so I just want to uh, tell you, thank you for your presentation and for your effort in, in trying to ensure access for, for people. But I know we do have some challenges ahead of us, especially um, just navigating through COVID. Um, I believe one of my concern was um, a little bit addressed earlier, um, just concerning like hospital workers. Um, I'm a nurse that works in Boston um, and I've been taking the commuter rail on the Worcester line um, and I take it at Natick Center. So we take it take it to Lansdowne, um, which is like the hub for a bunch of the hospitals there. Um, and I know even during this time, like our hospital was generous enough to offer parking um, for a lot of hospital workers um, who do hold the MBTA. Pass. However, that privilege will be ending, um, you know, in in on March first. So, you know, now looking at the schedule, um, we can't even get to work on time because, you know, like I think someone already raised the concern of hospital. A lot of us have to be in much earlier than what the current schedule even allows. Um, so, and then and now, like my concern, a lot of like our privilege is now going to be, you know, ending soon, which will cause a lot more influx of more hospital workers needing that more AM time. Um, or sometimes, you know, my, house, my husband's also a hospital worker and he um, also has to, um, you know, does also has to even sometimes get to work like a little bit earlier than anticipated just because of there's no train availability. There's like 90 minutes in between certain trains. Um, so it just seems like there's no middle ground for a lot of us. Um, so I know in your presentation, you mentioned, um, you know, there's cutting, cutting back on like the peak times. And, you know, I know they extended the, the nighttime, nighttime train for, you know, hospital workers, but, you know, what about more of like the morning ones? Um, and, um, you know, cause just cause that might also help with social distancing. Um, I think you did mention about an express train, I believe, that um, will be leaving, but I'm not, I'm not even sure if that's even going to stop at our stop, just because sometimes that skips us too. So just wanted to. to so I think I, I, maybe I can give you the express train actually will um, not help you in Natick Center. However, um, there will be a, a train at 505 and a train at 605. Um, the 605 will get to Lansdowne um, before 640. So hopefully that. Um, gives you some, gives you time. You know, there, there will be the 505 option. Um, the express train um, actually will jump beyond, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll express in from, I think it's, I actually think it might be, um, I can tell you. Um, but they, but those, those two will hit Natick Center, the 505 and the 605. Thank you, Rob. Uh, next, I'm gonna ask to mute Councillor Kenzie Bach, Councillor. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all uh, for holding this meeting this evening. Um, I am the District 8 Boston City Councilor um, for an area that includes the Fenway. Um, and I really wanna speak tonight to the 55 bus um, suspension. This is something that um, you know I and the whole neighborhood was very vocally against at the time of considering the cuts. Um, and I'm back before you now to implore the MBTA um, to to rethink this plan, especially with the federal aid that we've gotten, but frankly, because it's essential to um, to the neighbors in this community. And as I, as I said um, before, the the whole area, especially of the West Fens, is ringed by um, quite wide streets that 
are pretty difficult for folks who have mobility um, issues to, to cross. And so it's actually sort of a weird island that's kind of moated. And the only thing that, that gets you, the only thing that gets you in and out of that island, um, if you're public transit dependent, is the MBTA bus uh, at the 55. Um, and, you know, I want to just read, I had a constituent reach out to me today, um, and I um, you know, I've said a lot on this before, so I thought that I would try to help give this constituent voice today. Um, this is from Christopher Cullity. Um, he wrote to me today, he said, I live in the McBride house, which is for people living with HIV AIDS at 70 Queensbury Street. Um, when I took the 55 city bus to my pharmacy this morning, I saw this notice. I'm over 65 years old with bad ankles, knees and hips and many problems with HIV AIDS. The bus service cancellation will make me virtually housebound after March 14th when the 55 bus route is canceled. It will also make all the senior citizens at St. Cecilia's house stranded without public transportation as well. Um, that's right next to uh, the McBride is for HIV AIDS folks. And then St. Cecilia's is several hundred elders, many of whom are, are Chinese and Russian um, speaking um, and not on the Zoom tonight. Um, then he went on to say, you know, is there anybody who could make the T continue the 55 bus route instead of canceling it? They say suspended, I say canceled. I've been trying to get rid of the 55 bus route for years. Please think of the hundreds and hundreds of disabled and or elderly people who depend on bus route 55 to get to their doctor's appointments, the pharmacy, library, and lower cost supermarkets. Um, that's true. We have a lot of Chinese elders who go down to the Chinatown markets using this bus. Um, the, Saint, the Peterborough Senior Center is in that kind of island and a lot of seniors come to use it from outside. I wrote back to Mr. Cullity and told him about this meeting. And he said, thank you, Kenzie. I don't have the ability to do meetings on my computer. Um, but I can type out a message on my phone. After the 55 bus service ends, I'll have to cut back on going out. Um, he asked me to share this with everybody. He said, you know, on, until March 14, I'll have time to change my pharmacy, change banks, and try to change healthcare facilities from MGH, where I've been going to have my HIV treated for almost 20 years to someplace near here that will hopefully take me as a new patient. I love the care I receive at MGH, but after March 14th, I'll have to find a new healthcare place that will take me. The one and only reason that I chose to move into my apartment at McBride House in 2012 was because of the 55 bus stop being only 37 paces from my building. Um, and and I, I just really wanna stress that um, this is this is one of a number of seniors in the West in the West Fence community who has reached out to me and been like, I really don't know what I'm going to do without the 55, um, and who have relied on it. Um, and I, I just, I, I'm very frustrated with the idea of the T suspending it. And I also would really like to hear what, if any, metric is going to cause the T to bring this bus line back, because I think a lot of us share Mr. Colady's concern that the T is really withdrawing service from this neighborhood on a permanent basis with this cut. Um, so I, you know, I would like to hear how you guys are going to evaluate that. Um, but I just also, as the counselor for the district, really want to implore you to, um, to, to, you know, move back, retreat from this cut and uh, keep the 55 bus running. So thank you. Thank you, counselor. Uh, and I'm happy to connect with you online to see how we can help, um, your constituent regarding, regarding this and see what we can do on our end. So, um, I'll be following up with you. Um, at some point within the next 24 hours to, to chat about this. Uh, next, I'm going to ask uh, to unmute um, uh, Jennifer Glass. Jennifer? Yes, good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for everyone's um, work on these difficult issues in uh, difficult times. I did want to underscore that given the Housing Choice Act that was recently passed and our decarbonization goals as a state that um, these changes seem somewhat counterintuitive to what we are trying to achieve in terms of uh, larger planning for our future. Um, I live in Lincoln. I'm a member of the Board of Selectmen in Lincoln, and we do have affordable housing that is near our T state, our uh, commuter rail station currently. And I know that with Housing Choice, there will be a look at how we increase that housing um, and try to provide more affordable housing. And when service is um, not frequent enough, and when it is as expensive as it is. I think it makes it that much more challenging for communities like Lincoln to try to make sure that any affordable housing that we develop 
is truly affordable for people. We have to look at the totality of their experience. And if the T service is so infrequent that they have to rely on a car for their job, that's another expense. Or if the commuter rail pass is so expensive that it prohibits them from um, buying one on a monthly basis, that makes it difficult for uh, communities to be affordable. So I just, I know that you're sort of focused on these immediate changes, but as we think about this for the long term, uh, this just feels a, like a big backward step in terms of what we're trying to achieve in a variety of uh, different areas. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you. And I just, I just want to point out that, you know, one of the goals of the new schedules is to actually sort of increase frequencies and not be such a peak focused, like everyone's going in to commute to Boston in the morning to get to work and everyone's coming back at, at six o'clock to get home and actually have better all day service where we actually hope that we can encourage people to start using it for trips. I mean, frankly, I, the commuter rail really isn't something people use for kind of those ancillary or um, midday trips um, to go visit a friend, to go to a museum, to go do whatever, to go to see their doctor, because that's, it, it, I'm not sure we always had the ability to meet that, that other demand. And so this is sort of an effort to try to create a schedule to see how much we can start to capture people to, to, to make this the preferred mode of travel rather than their car at 10 in the morning. Um, so that is the goal of the new schedules, you know, and when, when they're available, but you will see that we really have kind of spread out that day. So people have many, we think have many more options. Um, we think it's gonna be a little simpler to use. And we are piloting some different fare ideas on different, um, a, 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 low, a low fare in Brockton right now in Chelsea, I believe that's still going, um, to see what sort of fare, um, what, what, you know, what sort of fares do encourage and incentivize people to ride. So obviously we're not doing it on the whole system. We're trying some pilots and we'll be, we'll be generating some of that information over the next couple of months. Um, but we are, we, we do hear what you're saying about making the trip um, more affordable for people and our piloting areas where we think that um, we can um, try those things out and then figure out how to roll them out when they make sense to other parts of the network. But thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Uh, next, I'm going to ask to unmute uh, Anne Marine uh, Peasy. Anne Marie, I've asked to unmute you. Oh, oh bear with me one second. Oh, Anne Marie? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, uh, I'm a nurse at Boston Children's Hospital and you already did answer the question about whether the trains were gonna start early again um, from Worcester. So I'm very happy to hear that there will be trains starting earlier again for all of us taking the train in. Um, but uh, my one question was, I didn't get to hear when that schedule was gonna start because I had just canceled my pass after taking the commuter rail in the whole pandemic. But then currently we cannot get in on time. So when was that going to start? Where the the new schedule of April 5th, the spring 5th. schedule will, will go into effect. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to unmute Mary Gail Parker. Mary Gail. Mary Gale, I've asked to unmute you. Hi, sorry, thank you. Um, I'm a 55 bus rider. I've ridden it for 30 years and I can get to some of the uh, Green Line stations, but there are a lot of people in this neighborhood who are either um, disabled or um, seniors who can't get around so well, and they're not going to be able to get to the Green Line at Kenmore or at the museum. Um, and I'm wondering uh, how you will determine if um, 
service can be restored because also uh, I don't think it can just be, you know, like you asking people to come and put their vote on the computer because I think there are a lot of seniors still in the neighborhood who either can't use computers or don't have computers. And I'm wondering if you're going to like send some people out to ask um, or how, how will you determine that? And thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary Gail. Um, Kat or Melissa, uh, did you, could you guys take a, a sec to try and answer that? Certainly, I can jump in and then Kat can fill in if there's anything else that she'd like to add. Uh, but um, thanks for mentioning the, you know, uh, ability to um, access the green line. But one of the other things, because we recognize that that can be, uh, in some cases, I think it's about a half mile walk to some of those green line stations from like part of the Fenway area. So uh, we've also been recommending that folks consider um, as alternate services accessing our Brookline Ave bus service, which is closer to a quarter mile. It does involve crossing Boylston Street, uh, but you can get to the eight, 19, 60, and 65 buses that feed into Kenmore Station and connect to the Green Line. So that's one of the other options that we're um, recommending. And we also uh, have the, uh, the ride complimentary paratransit service. So folks can go to uh, mbta.com slash the ride for information on uh, that, which may be, you know, an option that's a possibility for uh, folks for whom getting out to even Brookline Ave might be uh, a problem. Um, in addition to that, uh, for as we're considering uh, fall, you know, we're looking at uh, a number of different things. So in we, we get the question a lot of, you know, how do we know when to restore service if we can't measure ridership on a bus that doesn't exist? So um, some of the other indicators that we're looking at, uh, we have um, travel data. You know, we've been doing a lot more with, uh, we call it streetlight, uh, streetlight data uh, that is looking at, you know, uh, how people are traveling. And it's actually not just transit riders, but it's, you know, pedestrians and cyclists and motorists, um, as long as they have uh, cell phone data. Uh, now, whether that's, I know one of the groups that's not necessarily well represented in that group is the seniors. So that uh, is a complication that we've been thinking about. But uh, we've been also looking at survey data and especially um, working with like employers and trying to understand when are people going to start traveling in larger numbers uh, as we you know, have more vaccinations uh, and hopefully uh, get this pandemic behind us. So uh, Kat, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, add there? No, I think Herbert, I actually think um, the, the one other thing I'll mention and I think Angel might have something he wants to add too is um, that as we, like I said, with part of restoring service, we're also conducting a bus network redesign, which is gonna go through a series of public engagement this spring, summer, and fall as well. Um, and that will also have a lot of touch points for, for more than the data, but also trying to make sure we're speaking to people as well to get it, recognizing that data only tells so much. Um, and then Angel, do you wanna talk about the, uh, the coffee chats? Yeah, uh, happy to. Uh... So uh, with respect to the question around outreach, um, we've been, obviously we've been hosting these meetings uh, as well as a series of meetings in the fall. Um, we have a group of community liaisons um, that are part of our, that are part of our team that on Mondays host um, uh, what we call coffee chats. There was a recent article around this in the Boston Globe um, and the chats can be done via phone and we have them in multiple languages um, and um, you can find that information on mbta.com. Uh, and on top of that, we've been reaching out to uh, local community organizations um, subsequently from what we did in the fall. Um, and we've been, we've, been, we've been invited to, to several meetings either on the weekends, at nights, aside from these meetings, uh, and answering questions and a uh, sub uh, supplementing some of the information that we've been putting out here today. So that's the outreach that we've been doing um, uh, concertedly as an organization regarding the changes um, uh, that, that we're looking to do. Um, 
Uh, I ha we have one more question um, uh, from uh, Ginny Fairley. Uh, I'm gonna ask to unmute you now real quick. Hi, sorry about a uh, second question. Oh. Um, yeah, I um, as I was listening to your presentation, I realized what, besides the 30 minute to 40 minute wait for the ride, I am a ride user um, as well. Um, I It just dawned on me that all these suspensions of uh, 52, 55, 68, and 79, whoever else all talked about it, um, and the change of hours of operation, uh, the in that how many thousands of uh, ride users um, are going to be impacted by increased expenses, meaning they're going to go from a um, that they lived within three quarters of a mile of a bus stop, a T stop, um, well, not so much the T, a bus stop, especially, um, will now be uh, charged, uh, you know, five or six, or whatever it is, 515 or 535, whatever it is up to, and they used to spend $3. So I I didn't even compute that until I was listening tonight. So that that's very detrimental because the least that can afford it, people with disabilities on SSI and SSDI, um, now not only does the closed bus route get ripped away, but they have to spend more money if they were using the ride to get somewhere, um, either where that bus went or is going or used to go and then to where they're going. Um, th this is very disastrous. I think the, the ride information has been very much glossed over. Um, I even searched for it on the web um, under the forging ahead uh, you know, information. I saw that it said ride one place, but then I couldn't find the exact you know, impact. Do we have those numbers of thousands of people that are going to be affected by um, their ADA ride not, no longer being and now it's a premium ride? Hi, Jeannie, it's Carol. Yeah, hi, Carol. I saw you on the <laughs> participant list. I figured you were going to answer me. I haven't seen you in a long time. Yeah. Good to, good to see you and, and glad to hear a right question. Um, we are still in the process of reviewing um, all trips taken by every customer um, that may have been in and around those bus stops. Our initial glass wasn't thousands of ride customers at all. It was a, a smaller amount, but as someone earlier had said, it only takes one person to be impacted um, by a change. Um, so we are still working very diligently, taking a look in, in the database to see who's traveling where, and we will be out, you know, sending out um, information directly to those folks to let them know. Um, once I do have some solid numbers for you, Jeannie, I will certainly get them to you. Yeah, I mean, also you don't know who is taking, personally taking the 52 or the 55, who now will have to take the ride, but then they're sort of, it's a double jeopardy. Um, they took the public transportation to, uh, because they were just barely able to do that like myself, because I find my way to that bus stop, it should have a buzzer. <laughs> but then I all of a sudden can't take that bus. Now I go on the ride, but now that bus stop is no longer near me. So, I mean, it's just, you won't even know that number um, of who took the bus and now takes the ride um, and now has a, a premium ride, draw, you know, ride. Don't you think? I mean, will you know that number? I wouldn't know the number cat for the for the fixed route question. That's what no. I you know I use a fixed route when I can. When I can't, I can't. Um, but um, for example, I take you wouldn't know, but I uh, take the fifty nine um, on uh, to to work. You know, half of the year, especially the bad weather year. And if they if you stopped that or infrequently made it so that I was late every day, I wouldn't be taking the fifty nine. I might have to take the ride or my Uber pilot. No, it's actually Lyft pilot. Um, but, you know, here's someone who's trying to do the best they can with public transportation and only take the ride when they, uh, you know, can't get uh, close enough to some public transportation. And you wouldn't know those people impacted. Plus, it's in the premium ride now, not an not a ADA ride. Uh, it's just those things kind of go through my mind. It bothers me. I'm a ride user and a T user and multiple user um, Uber Lyft when I have, have the chance with the ride pilot. 
Um, and I just, I just worry that uh, we're, we're double jeopardy or double impacting people with disabilities by taking, a, especially suspending a route. Uh, maybe not so much diverting a route a little bit or changing the hours a little bit, but we're definitely impacting them. Thanks very much for listening to me though. Appreciate it. Thank you for your comment. I, we really do appreciate it. It, it definitely is, uh, as Carol said, it, it, it's definitely going to be an impact for some individuals are likely to be. Um, and that being said, for those who are listening, there's, uh, it's only when, this will only back impact individuals who, when they were within three quarters of any MBTA bus route. Um, so for example, for the Route 55, because there's so much density of other alternatives, um, and there's other rules about being in a contiguous area that none, no riders in the 55 area would be impacted or their destination there, um, but something like the Route 52 would potentially have impact. So it is, it is a smaller number, um, as Carol said, and we're still trying to finalize that. Um, I, I think we're, I'm actually going to share my screen again because I think we wanted, as we approach time, and I think we're losing our interpreters, um, wanted to share the contact information um, and know that if people have additional questions, they can always, or comments, they can always email the MBTA community engagement team at public engagement, all one word, at mbta.com. Yep, thank you, Kat. Um, uh, thanks everyone for joining us uh, and for sharing your comments and concerns. Uh, tonight's recording uh, uh, is going to be posted online over the next few days. And again, as Kat uh, mentioned, if you have any additional questions, we just ask that you uh, please submit them to the MBTA community engagement team. Uh, and again, that is at, at public engagement, uh, all one word, at mbta.com. Again, public engagement at mbta.com. And you can see it posted on your screen. Thank you, everyone, and I hope everyone stays safe. Bye-bye.